Gabrielle's um, raising the question for us uh, of what Gabrielle was saying taking distance from a certain heritage. And that is one of the big questions, by the way, is your relation, how do you create a legacy? How do you situate yourself in a legacy? It might be unconscious, it might be uh, constituted by all sorts of signifiers that are not even part of your um, password system. It, it might be something that uh, bypasses you. In other words, it's not a matter of subjective volition or decision. It might be um, something that has kidnapped you or hijacked you. These, these are real questions and something like disavowal or denial, all the fair words in German, benignum, verwerfung, and so on. Um, might be interesting to be aware of also something that you think you can um, say is not your heritage or legacy, which I find myself sometimes saying that this is not the heritage that I inscribe myself in, but it's not up to me. It's what we were born into, what we carry, what we can't help being um, last on by. So let's move now to today's um, reading, which um, was named as the Forgiveness Text by Derrida, and let's see how he initializes. This is just one version, it's not even a full version of the small version, the abbreviated version. Um, Remembering that forgiveness as in English and in German has the gift in it, or what is given, what is to be given. So uh, le pardon has the don. It's, a, it's part of uh, Derrida's thinking of the gift, the gift of death and other gifts. And what is given in forgiveness. So. Um, I have a few remarks to make, and then I want us just to start reading closely two sections and, and call it a day. Um, it's always good to, to have a very strict and rigorous relation to the text and not to free associate and not to, um, to think that uh, something like experience that you might have had is pertinent. At the same time, Derrida is putting a, a call out, it seems, to something that we think we know, and certainly something that we've been grown up on or by, um, and, and invested in, in some way or another. Um, so, you, one can begin anywhere, almost. It's so rich, even though it's, it's unpretentious and small and spare, as texts go and as texts by Derrida go. Um, forgiveness seems like it's something like a gracious gift. You're given the gift of forgiveness when you're forgiven, but then he's going to go after it and see that even if someone says, I forgive you. The response might be, who are you to forgive me? It's already an aggressive um, um, condescending. It comes from above, down. Anyone or anything that would say, I forgive you, comes from above and moves down. You don't look up and say, I forgive you, usually. You always look down. That's a problem. Um, the great poet Heinrich Heine said that he's not going to forgive anyone. That's in God's job description. And it's not for man to even try to forgive. It's not possible, and he's, he ain't doing it. You know? So, um, for Derrida, forgiveness in the purity of its concept, paraconcept, and um, as unconditional 
would have to be given without exchange and without condition, of course. So, until now, and he'll point out, and I think you've got this already, that there's even a, a kind of um, addiction to forgiveness and forgiving oneself and forgiving one's horrible parents or horrible <coughs> violators. Why? Because it's therapeutic and it will relieve you and allow you to move on. That's conditional. Derrida says if there's any finality to forgiveness, if you have any purpose or point or intention attached to forgiveness, it's not forgiveness. It's therapy. Or be it historical, because there are historical, political acts of forgiving, and he goes through in the larger versions um, what's happened in um, South Africa. Or be they personal, if you think, I should forgive this um, harassing figure in my, that keeps on coming back and, and haunting me because I will feel better. I will be able to live more easily. That's not forgiveness, according to Derrida. So let's, let's try to delve into what unconditional forgiveness might look like, but first let's think of what the stakes are in forgiveness because nothing happens without forgiveness. In fact, the scene, the exemplary scene of forgiveness would be a testamentary one. When someone's on their deathbed and they say, I forgive you. Or you beg for forgiveness and you're kissing the hand of someone who's dying. That's the moment of asking for forgiveness. So whether or not that theatricality or, or um, mise en scène or staging of the act of forgiveness occurs in that way, any act or demand or hope for forgiveness is structured by the last wish and testamentary boundary situation or limit situation of a life expiring. That is what forgiveness, before everything stops or is extinguished so that we can have history or life. And this is something that Hegel goes into as well, I need you to forgive me. I need to be able to move on and not be stuck in the place of the unforgiven. So um, temporality, history, anything that might flow or move or allow for even a personal or a biographical development of some sort requires some sort of relation to the gift and grac graciousness of forgiveness. I stumbled over grace because I remembered that Lacan says that psychoanalysis doesn't deal with grace or what that might be, a moment of grace, a moment of reprieve or suspension. Uh, so let us move on. Uh, there's, there's many moments to, um, that we could begin with, but let me just um, begin in a certain way and just first of all remind us that forgiveness, to be pure forgiveness, must have no meaning because meaning is something that has an end, a purpose, a telos. It's something other than forgiveness. It must have no finality, as I just explained, and even no intelligibility, says Derrida. It's very radical. If you think you understand why someone's forgiving you, that's already a calculation. That's already putting it to use or to work in some way. If it's intelligible, it means you're already subsuming it under some sort of uh, concept, belief, need, so it must not even be intelligible. Like, nor is it clear that one knows, knows that one has been forgiven. 
because one can say I forgive you or receive forgiveness. Oh, let's say one could think one has forgiven, but then something one day, some sniper, <coughs> eternal sniper, shows up and goes after the person. We don't even know, we can't master forgiveness. We don't even know if we've given forgiveness. So it's already not something masterable by something like a subject. You may say, no, I forgave this person long ago, and then suddenly some aggression, some secret Swiss account of aggression and resentment <laughs> opens up that you didn't know you had. You know, so if you think you know, you master, you maneuver, you manipulate forgiveness, or you can even give it, then it's part of an exchange system, it's part of a conscious uh, transaction, it's not forgiveness. Um, there's many, many issues that Derrida um, goes into that are splintered that I might start with rather than more general remarks. Let's say you forget, you for, oh, that's good. I forgot to say forget. We have the um, utterance, very common, forgive and forget. Let's forgive and forget. Derrida says, yeah, really? If you forget, you, you're not forgiving. Mm -hmm. Because to say forgive and forget means you're forgetting. Obviously, that seems like a tautology. That, that can't, for Derrida, now I'm, it's a sneak peek and spoiler, if that's okay. The forgiving, should it ever be possible, but it's impossible, would have to be in the greatest lucidity of the memory of the moment of the greatest pain and violation. Because if you say, someone, let's say you go to someone and excuse these catechistic terrible examples, I said there might not even be a subject, and now I'm going to give little baby subject examples, but it'll help us. These, these will be like training wheels that we can drop in a moment. So let's say um, you, you um, offer, you want to give forgiveness to someone. And this isn't where I was going to go. Let me, let me just stabilize for a moment the text. Um, OK, well, this is just a repetition of what I was trying to get across, which is sometimes you say to someone, listen, um, I really want you, I need you to forgive me. And they'll say, it's forgotten. An alert should go off. That means you're not forgiven. <laughs> If it's forgotten, that's another, um, that's another operation, you know? Yes? And it's not. Exactly. And how can you? Exactly. <laughs> if someone says it's forgotten, then it's not forgotten. Thank you. Um, so, really, you don't know what I'm talking about? Don't worry about it. Worry about it. Um, the other, there are other, um, um, let's say, Micro maneuvers that collapse on themselves. Let's, it's a question of address, too. Let's say you want to address the perpetrator or wrongdoer. Or the wrongdoer or per perpetrator comes to you and says, um, I was a shit and I'm sorry and I'd like to be forgiven. But the person who, or, per, or, or location of utterance, who comes up to you and says that is no longer identical or even the same as the perp, as the one who 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 molested or, or pained or, or did you harm. Because if a person has already gone through all the implicit transformations to be able to say, I am different from I, and the one who stands before you condemns the one who, who um, in the past permitted himself or herself to do you such enormous harm, then you're not addressing the one in the past or the perp. You're addressing a reformed or reformatted 
version of the one who did harm. Okay, so there's a problem even of address. Whom are you addressing? Can you address the perp in the moment of perp perpetration? Which is never free frozen, but is already elusive and escapes you. It's a, a question that gets multiplied in many different ways, as when Derrida says um, that um, in South Africa, the wife of someone who was killed was asked to accept the apologies of the perps. And she said, I can't. I cannot substitute for the dead person my husband. I cannot, I'm not, I'm not authorized. I have no authority to say that. How can I even say I? I cannot forgive you because I'm not, I can't ventriloquate my husband's, my dead husband's, my ghost husband's, my beloved husband's, with whom I can't speak in, in human terms. I'm not in no position. I'm, I'm actually illegitimately here. So I, I wish I could respond, respond to this, and we could have the great deluded ceremony of being happy and reconciled, but it's strictly impossible because I cannot be the broadcast system for the victim. But she herself has been wounded by having him taken away from her, so she, she can, she can to forgive. Her. She can speak to her own wounds, but not to the crime that oh, yeah. she's being asked to address. She can, yes, she can testify, which she did, by the way, very good point. She did testify to her devastation and loss, but she cannot offer forgiveness as an absolute, resolute statement and um, behavior that would close the case. All of these um, efforts are efforts at closure, which yesterday I promised won't happen. So um, um, there's other questions that Derrida uh, briefly and regionally kind of taps. For example, very banal moments, like if you get on a bus and, and you step on someone's toes and you say, excuse me. That's a bizarre, banal moment because, first of all, he'll say, I don't want this uh, kind of siphoning off of forgiveness into other um, speech acts. And by the way, I have to ask you if you know what speech acts are, so remind me. Awesome. Okay. Um, so um, he doesn't want it to be confused or confounded with, with excuses, amnesty, um, regret or other types of um, letting it go. He wants us to stay strictly near the um, meat, so to speak, or vegetarian, not easy, of forgiveness and forgivability. So if you get on a bus, you step on someone's toe, and you say, excuse me, that's a strange thing, because have you not already excused yourself? and saying, excuse me, is that an imperative? Is that a request? Is it both and? Is it a statement? Is it a performative positing? You will excuse me. You will have excuse me. I am here with excuse. Or I beg your forgiveness or your pardon. Um, all of these approaches to utterances organized around the seeking or the receiving of forgiveness are something that Derrida is uh, putting up in his switchboard and making calls to that we want to pick up and listen to. So, yes? Uh, I don't mean to, to, to go up too much into another field, but for myself, the only way I'm understanding this conversation is in the Lacanian terms, I'm thinking a lot of the L schema. Uh, I don't understand how any of this is is not on the imaginary axis. This, this, the, the relation of forgiveness or pardon is not between basically an ego and a small other, and not between the subject and the big other. Mm -hmm. There's not a matter that 
whatever kind of piece we're talking about that might supposed to be um, gotten from some kind of forgiving gesture is actually a symbolic matter, something between a subject and a big other that is not there. All right, well, I think we've come up at the with the same points that there he does scoring. However, he doesn't, uh, he would, I think, if I, I, I don't feel I can speak for him, but I think he would find that a little reductionist. And also he's questioning all of the terms that you just brought up because um, precisely by beginning with the gift of forgiving and the don of le pardon, he's showing uh, something that would occur in an, an economy. In other words, there is no subjective or ecological initiative here. Um, and we haven't even located, we don't have a map yet, even though everything depends on our thinking that we know what forgiveness is. There isn't a map or a graph yet that could account for what it is we are thinking when we think we know, or we've experienced, or we can give, or we can receive forgiveness. Whereas your terms for this moment, when you say, I see nothing other than this chart, that, that, that might be a little unsettling because it, it does focus on what you don't see, but what you want to see, which is to say a, a chart that would explain everything. <coughs> Um, I don't think there's a fundamental disagreement, except that Derrida will pick off every one of those terms. There isn't an ego here, and where there is an ego, there might be a charade of forgiveness. So let's see where, where these intersect. These, um, um, Derrida isn't working with a system nor with a chart, nor with something that has been really nailed in terms of any kind of mathing that I think Lacan would... Um, I mean, Lacan is very good at all sorts of things and um, I've written many texts on Lacan, but I think here there's a real divergence, you know? And let's see if that works or not for you or for Lacan or for Derrida, what I've just said. Um, so, where were we? Um, I mean, what, what did you hope to accomplish just now? To say, we've got it all figured out? No, not at all. Um, I, what, I don't know if I hope to accomplish anything, but I'm finding, I, I mean, those are terms that have a resonance with me because right. I've understood them through certain experiences. And so I'm just trying to, uh, no, I mean, I'm not trying to, I mean, I felt something. shut down by oh, it. No, 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 but no. I'm very interested in what you're saying because I don't think you're wrong in bringing into the discussion and contributing the imaginary field, you know, the I field mean, of the imaginary. Like you, That's helpful, actually. When you were saying something like there's no, it's hard to posit an I in the, in the, the, the predicate for, to mm -hmm. forgive, I think of this, of a, the split subject in a sense that when that I is positive, you're on that kind of imaginary relation. Uh, and when you struggle with positing an I, it's because it's a symbolic issue. It's like at a different rate. Like some of these problems, I guess I'm trying to say the this impossibility of forgiveness or this trouble with it is maybe a issue of registers. That's what I guess I, is something I was okay. trying to Okay, okay, let's try to integrate that and see um, what can happen. That's not wrong, of course, but um, I don't know if it accounts for the difficulties, and that's why I'm grateful for you to bring up uh, something that might um, not account for the excess of this text mm -hmm. in its deceptive simplicity. and. And let's see, let's look closely and start reading together. I only have with us the English. Uh, is, do you have like a page 31? We do have that page. We're, we're missing a couple of pages. Yeah. I know, I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> Page 31. Now, do
do you feel you've already understood this text, or is this work working for you? Should we continue? Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. So, um, on the bottom of 31, do you see I shall risk this proposition? Yeah. Good. Each time forgiveness is at the service of a finality, so this is what I tried to say in some words, be it noble and spiritual, like atonement, redemption, reconciliation, salvation. So each time it's at the service of these very um, well-known signifiers and wishes that have been expressed historically, religiously, theologically. Each time that it aims to re-establish a normalty, social, national, political, psychological, by a work of mourning, by some therapy or ecology of memory, then the forgiveness is not pure, nor is it a concept, nor its concept, is its concept. Forgiveness is not, it should not be normal, normative, normalizing. It should remain exceptional and extraordinary in the face of the impossible. Uh, I, I really want you to understand what is being said here. So any time that forgiveness is sought or is made subservient to another goal, as I was trying to say, whether it's uh, something like, I want to atone, I want reconciliation, I want redemption, I need to be saved, then, and each time that politically, socially, it tries to reestablish a normalty, like, you decide not to be in a relation of hostility to someone, and you want to establish normalcy between a ten, in a tense standoff. So you say, um, I want you to forgive me. That's not forgiveness, because you have another goal in mind. You have a strategy, you have a strategic end, you have a tactical maneuver going on. So anything that tries to establish a normality or a normative <laughs> situation by a work of mourning and a tchawa abai, a work of mourning means that you want to let something go. Mourning disorder that Derrida and others work on and I'm sure your, your thesis on this has something to do with it, yeah? Um, or the crypt formation or incorporation which is to say you can't let go of the dead object or the undead, the figure of the undead. So if you're doing the work of mourning, meaning when forgiveness becomes the same thing as mourning, meaning you want to let go, you're, you're really letting that which is dead cross over and you're letting go if that's what forgiveness is about, so that you can establish a normal, so-called normal life, no matter how pervy it might be, it's still your normal seat. That's not forgiveness. Because you've, you've kind of had another goal in mind. You want to accomplish something other than forgiveness. If forgiveness is in any way in service of these possible and very lofty Goals. No one says don't don't arrive at normalcy or normal normality in life. Don't stop. No one says that you have to destabilize in a risked and, and tremulous way all the time. But just don't call it forgiveness. Because if you want it to accomplish something that will be recuperative, healing, therapeutic normalizing, stabilizing, you had another, you had an intention other than forgiveness. And even if you had the intention of forgiveness, you're not forgiven, because you know too much. So it's really where it's unintelligible and you don't know what's going on, which may never happen. Again, Derrida says if it weren't impossible, he wouldn't be working with it. Yes? It's a bit of a methodological question, but how does, how, if, if we can't, how, do, how does he know that we, when we don't have it, if we can't know that we ever have it, that how do we, how can we say that this is not it if we don't know what, when we can't know when it is it? 
All right. Um, because right now he's ticking off um, ways in which we have inhabited and enacted forgiveness. So he's, um, he's looking at what philosophically, traditionally, and historically has been understood as forgiveness, right? He says, um, in these works and in this work, this is a very condensed version of his seminar on forgiveness which he gave at NYU a while ago. Um, and, and he shows how every instance of forgiveness that we think we have a hold on or grasp of has been in service of something, one of these things. You know, but um, strictly speaking, you're not wrong at all to say, if we don't know what it is, how do we know what it isn't? Both he and Hannah Arendt and others will say, oh, all I can tell you sometimes is what it's not. And that, then they are referring to a whole body of work. Um, so let's, let me back off, though that's a scandalous um, version of the gaze and say how one of the initiators of this text could be um, identified. The great essayist and philosopher Jan Klevich wrote a, brush, uh, a little book in which he asks, can the Germans be forgiven? And in the first book, so he, said, he will have written two books. And by the way, that's a beautiful thesis topic is when poets and writers and thinkers write twice in a corrective effort. Baudelaire does this, he corrects in correspondence one poem with another poem, and it's very interesting to see how they put themselves in a straitjacket and try to straighten out their excesses and right, <coughs> right the wrongs that they think they've committed. Hölderlin does it, all sorts of poets, all sorts of writers, double up on themselves and try to undo the damage they did. So Yankovitch will write twice on the question, can the Germans be forgiven? And the first time, he's pretty generous. He goes, yeah, why not? The second time, he says, I don't know what I was thinking. That was wrong. And there are many reasons why they can't be forgiven. One of them being, they've never asked for forgiveness. So why give them forgiveness if they haven't asked for forgiveness? And so um, Derrida will then say that he's troubled by this because he offers that pure, unconditional forgiveness, if it ever were to be imagined as conferable or bestowable, would have to be bestowed with, with or without the person asking for it, the guilty party asking for it. Because once you say, once you start a transaction, like in a, you know, Middle Eastern uh, market or something, I'm, I'm talking about all of them, Israeli, Palestinian, so on. Once you start a transaction going, then it's not forgiveness. I'll forgive you if you say you want to be forgiven. But don't expect me to forgive you unless you ask me to forgive you. Or, if I ask you to forgive me, will you forgive me? No, there's no bargaining going on here. Um, so this is one thing that Jan Klevich says, you know, first of all, I was wrong because the Germans, first of all, Derrida says, what's the Germans? You know, that makes him shudder. The Germans have never asked for forgiveness. Um, is that a sudden subject formation of, of a national bloated uh, proportion, what is the Germans? As if it's one entity that's recognizable and unfissured, unproblematic. Uh, secondly, um, he said, then there's a question of, a punishment should be, should fit the crime, which is typical um, political philosophy, right? But a punishment, a, a crime of incalculably destructive proportions, nothing fits it. There's no calculation. 
there's no punishment that would be adequate to the crime. Um, so that doesn't work. All these calculations don't work. In any case, Derrida takes on Yanklevich, who is a highly esteemed, beautiful writer, thinker, very delicate, very thoughtful, very troubled. And this is where this, the spoiler comes and the sneak preview, because Yanklevich shows how the Germans are unforgivable. So why, and they don't even care whether they're forgiven or not. So why, why even, why did I even bring this up, he wonders. Um, and Derrida, again, butting up against the impossible, says, only the unforgivable, if something is forgivable, like you stepped on someone's toe and assuming that that person didn't want to kill you in return or whatever, Okay, so it's forgivable, that's not an issue. It's in the, in the realm of the possible. But it's only where it's un impossible and unforgivable that forgiveness comes up at all. You can only forgive the unforgivable. Spoiler alert, says Derrida. Otherwise, why are we even talking about And that's why it might be only the job description of God, last judgment style to decide whether or not you're forgiven. It might, may not be a terrestrial or mortal assignment that can be carried through by a mere mortal. Uh, in this move to the impossibility of forgiveness, do we know anything about the event itself? Does it, does it presuppose a certain agreement in accounting for the event? Like, um, hey, in the case of the earlier example, the husband was murdered, it's, it's a fact, the husband was murdered. Um, but in other, maybe more family-based emotional traumas, there's not an accordance of your side versus my side. Does that play at all into? That, that's a brilliant uh, contribution to the discussion and complication of some of the aspects of the discussion, because you're absolutely right. To the extent that the event might be an event, therefore eventful and not and a gift, 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 meaning gift, poisonous in German, gift. It might not be perceptible. It might not be something that you can describe. The horrors are quote unquote unthinkable. And so there isn't even language to, to um, draw toward a discourse or rhetoric of accountability or account. You can't account for it because it exceeds all measure in terms of atrocity. So that's, you're right in there with the most complicated uh, level of, of setting up the impossibility of forgiveness because forgiveness assumes normally that we know what the object or act or infringement or attack. We have language or descriptive language to account for it. So here we have um, the real problem, which is which um, moves beautifully with the, the whole um, earthquake of, of this um, textual questioning. Um, of if this, if the crime is such an event. And such is even too determinate. But let me try to stutter for it. Such an event that it must be in unforgivable and must be is wrong to cross out, bracket all these words. And it must be impossible that we can't even account, have it, we, there's no accountability, there's no account, there's no narrative stronghold or container that could hold the traumatic uh, blanking out that the crime um, um, supposedly names without being able to name. I'm just In regards to what you're saying about account, I just uh, find it uh, interesting to think about Martin Luther who went to confession and then five minutes later he was thinking, did I really mean my, uh, what I was confessing, was I sincere, did I say it all? Uh, so so this, this problem of, of giving expression to it and signification and meaning uh, 
that's interesting in that regard too, I think, and <coughs> gives uh, a repetitious uh, circle on it. That's very important too. The, the, the act of enunciation that we might think, even Martin Luther, might think he's in, in control of and has mastery over, where suddenly after it's done, where you say the impossible and you've spilled and dished the worst possible crimes that you've committed in his case against humanity also. Um, then there's the, um, the irrevocable doubt that creeps in or, or seizes you up and you wonder, did I say it all? Did I cover it? Did I account for it? Did, do I have a way of accounting? Did I actually have access to the crimeness of the crime? Did I sidestep it? Did I sugarcoat it? Did I misname it? Did I miss the target of, of where I was um, doing harm? So that's an absolutely essential um, contribution, but it also points out the slippage that Derrida pointed uh, toward, which is when you have a slippage toward confession or something other than forgiveness. These, this is a constellation, that's a satellite formation of forgiveness, confession, is a way of seeking forgiveness or absolution, but to the extent that one has sought absolution, one has not been involved in the impossible transaction with forgiveness, because you, you were looking for absolution or salvation or to close the account. And that's the problem too, which is the unclosable account, the endless cold case of the crime. Yeah, exactly. When, you, when you're saying the impossibility of that, just the world has irreparably changed. It has gone into a different direction because of this infraction. So this person, the violator, is asking the victim for something that's impossible. I cannot go back and repair this. It's not, it's not my power. To... That's very helpful because Derrida <laughs> says, if forgiveness were purely forgiveness to be conferred ever, it would have to be by going back into the moment of greatest violation, violence, and horror, unrepressed, if you can imagine it. And in that, in that place, of absolute laceration and damage, rather than, I've forgotten about it, don't worry about it, or it's time has passed, we're okay now, I'm healing. No, go to the place of unhealing and perpetration and greatest injury, and then can you say, I forgive you? Well, what, about, what about an animal that violates your property or something? and it doesn't know it, it's completely oblivious and it goes about its business. That's the unforgivable that's able to be forgiven. Because no, they're, they're that, that would, the unforgivable... Sorry, that's very... No, no, no it's good. because we could really jam on that and, and look at the intrications because maybe, the, let's imagine someone says, I ask your forgiveness, I was an animal when I violated you. So that animal, where do you locate it? It's not nice to the animals, you know, to say. But what, what I mean is yeah. if, somebody, if somebody violates you in some way, but, you, but they are completely unaware of it. That's what they'll say. That's a problem too. But the moment of seeking absolution, confession, and it's good that we're getting stuck in all this because this is how complicated it is. They will say, I wasn't aware. And that's a problem too. Well, if you weren't aware, then whom am I addressing? I need to go to the person. But is one aware of one by one's violence? All these questions, which are metaphysical strongholds, come up. And that's why this becomes, that's why I said this is deceptively simple. I wanted to start with it and show how profoundly impossibly it, it gets um, structured and destructured. Uh, we talked about how um, it's impossible to forgive. Um, it's also impossible to ask for forgiveness. So when in 1970, Willy Brandt made his knee fall in Warsaw, he fell to his knees in Warsaw, 
to, well, to ask for forgiveness. People didn't believe him. For whom is he talking? Is he falling on his knees for the Germans? For those who are still there? For those who have committed the crimes? For their ancestors? For, for This whom? is a good point. And I, Sorry, there's a second point to this. Um, the memorial for the murdered Jews of Europe in the center of Berlin, right next to Brandenburg Gate. Um, when this was built, um, um, and I think still, um, it has not been received like unanimously as a um, real asking for, for forgiveness, but more as a piece of, and that's when I heard this word for the very first time, Sündenstolz, pride of the sin. Well, you, you, you committed the greatest crime of the century, and then you built the greatest memorial at the most important place of the capital of the country that did it. You can't ask. If it was smaller, if it wasn't there. Subway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Home sweet home. Go ahead. Every act of asking for forgiveness will fail. Well, then we're on the same page. Yeah. Um, what was your first example that I wanted to? Well, yeah. Grant. 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 So when Clinton wanted to. This is a, a moment that that um, that um, Derrida wants us to refer ourselves to, which is when, for example, when Clinton wanted to get on his knees and and ask forgiveness for the slave trade. Um, there's all the impossibility and necessity of of the theatricality. This is why Derrida insists it's a mise en scène, it's a theater. It's, you have to ceremon uh, uh, offer a ceremony and create some sort of staging. Um, but that created a wa wildfire of, of um, controversy. So I, I leave this in suspension, which is um, what does it mean when a representative of a people, a legacy, a heritage, whether disavowed or assumed, falls on his knees and says, and this, this is a question of also Japan, so on, and says, and whom is one addressing? We fucked up, we, at, we, seek, we seek forgiveness. Who's going to respond? John, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so we have this opposition.